So today, first before we start this lecture, I want to say there is a guest lecture next week on the 16th. <clears throat> so Pia Wilson and uh, his colleague will present what they are doing in development in Struzot. So I don't know if you have probably used some of the software in, in the computer labs. So uh, they will tell us how, how they do development of these kind of softwares. <clears throat> so today I will talk about uh, visualization uh, using many different tools that I've been using before. <clears throat> so we're going to look at a software called Paraview, uh, which is a very powerful tool for any scientific visualization that you would like to do. So I'm just going to short overview of what Paraview is, and then I'm going to show some Paraview examples. At the end, I will show how to generate data that you can re read into Paraview from your own code. <clears throat> so Paraview is an open source, uh, scalable visualization application. Uh, it also supports distributed computation because many, most of the visualization do, the visualization algorithm is actually uh, not about displaying it on the screen. It's actually to cut the models, to create ISO lines, and that is, can be very time consuming for a CPU, especially if you have large models and large results. <clears throat> so using Paraview, you can actually distribute it over multiple servers. Uh, we're not going to use this course, but it's, it's, it's there. It has an open, flexible user interface. Uh, bit of a warning, it's complex, but it's when you get uh, you kind of know how the principle for that user interface is very clear. It's very intuitive. It's also very extensible, so it builds upon plugin architecture. I think there are over 500 plugins in the program pre-compiled for different techniques or different methods of reading data. So scientific visualization, what is it? Uh, these are some examples of, of uh, visualization that have been done. Uh, it can be both uh, fluid dynamics, for example, at the top level that there's uh, streamlines going over a car. Uh, it can be uh, turbulence uh, simulations. It can be, uh, most of these are actually um, flow simulations. They can also be chemistry simulations and finite element simulations. That we should be doing. This is, uh, it's very used. Um, because it's open source, uh, it's, uh, and it's easy to download uh, and it supports most of the scientific visualization available. It's very heavily used. It has won, won several awards as well. Um, and also, it can handle data ranges of any data size. Basically. So you can, you can do small simulation that you do with the two dimensional uh, flows that you do or stress simula simulations. But it can also hand handle six billion cells to visualize, and it, I think it's even more today. So it, it's a it's a tool for going both small and large, and you use the same uh, conceptual model for both small and large problems. <clears throat> so what we are going to use in this course is the Paraview client. Uh, the Paraview suite consists of multiple applications. We have the Paraview client here. That is the user interface application that we use. There is also a special Python interpreter called PV Python that you can do all the things that you can do in the primary application in code as well. So you can write visualization in code. And actually, from the primary client, you can go from the visualization here to generate the Python uh, code that you can run separately as well. There's a web based Paraview and there's some other things as well. Uh, it's the user interface created in Qt, you know, toolkit. So it's uh, this application uses the C++ version of, of Qt. Uh, there's a Paraview server underneath here that starts automatically when you run Paraview. And then it's built upon something called DTK, which is the visualization toolkit. Uh, it's one of the largest C++ libraries in the world for scientific visualization. And, and uh, so you can, you can see this as Paraview being a, uh, application that uses the VTK library. And underneath here, uh, VTK can use OpenGL, which is a hardware uh, standard for 
the hardware accelerated graphics using games as well. Uh, it can use MPI for uh, scaling in parallel, and also some other network communication tools. So it's a quite powerful architecture. Uh, skip this one here. Uh, it's used on several large labs in the world. Um, so there is it used for visualization. One of many of the large simulations is run on the, the US labs. So it's exascale, petascale capable. So just going back to what, what visualization is. So when you run your programs, you get something like this. You get a lot of numbers floating from numbers, scalar values, vectors uh, in, in text files or in databases. And what you really want to do is kind of see how these values, what they really are. And that to go from that, that number of data to visualization, here you can use the Paraview tool. Paraview can uses a certain number of primitives to do the visualization. So the base primitives here are a rectilinear grid, basically rows and columns of cells uh, in the grid-like structure. We can have a non-uniform grid, so that is a grid that has some kind of rules determining the, the sizes of the different grid elements. There is a curved linear grid, which defines rows and columns, but on the curved uh, in the current form. There's a poly polygonal grid, which is basically a CAD model. So it's based on uh, surfaces of triangles or quads that are connected together in topology. So a surface model. And you can have unstructured grids. So basically that is uh, tetrahedral elements and two-dimensional elements connected together in different ways. These are the basic data structures you have to create to be able to open them in parallel. And we are going to use the polygonal model and not, perhaps not so as an abstraction grid, but the polygonal data model uh, in this course. Uh, yeah. There is also uh, some resources here to get how to get help. There is an excellent book or guide called the Parable Users Guide that goes through uh, steps on how to do the visualization. There is the tutorials part here, which shows some where you can go through some standard data sets and do the visualization of those. And of course, the main page is the paraview.org uh, homepage where you can download the application as well. There is also a help menu in the program uh, for a lot of the things that you want to, to do. So as you can see, there's a paraview tutorial that is starting with paraview. So I'm actually going to Instead of going through the slides, I'm going to demo this live. So this is the main parallel user interface. It's very standard user interface. You have toolbars. So this is the main toolbar where you open the model. Uh, open, there is also a way of say, exporting the data. Uh, if you want to restart from the beginning, there is no new in this program. So if you want to kind of start fresh, there is this reset arrow here, which resets the model, empties everything out. Uh, then here you have something called the pipeline browser. So visualization in, in the Paraview starts from the source of your source of the data. So you're reading the data set. That is the start of the pipeline. And then you pipe that data set through filters and different the manipulators here coming down here. And every, I will show you later here, but all of these here will be displayed here. And then you can manipulate them here. So if you select the uh, object here, you will, its properties will be shown here. So to search. I will just do a very simple model. So instead of importing any data, I will, I will create a sphere and, and use those the sphere. So there is, where we have the notion of sources and that is uh, things that generate data in a certain kind. So we'll get geometric shapes here and I will do a cylinder here. And now I see nothing happened here. So Paraview, because many of the inputs to Paraview can be really large. It doesn't visualize directly. So it gives you the option of setting the parameters 
of the object or sources before I actually display it. And you see here also the, the button here applied with green. That means there is things to be done. So I just press apply here. And now you can see here I, I got the cylinder. And I can I can I can rotate this in, in on the screen like this. Uh, and if I now you can see that the object is selected here and the eye is open here, that means that it's visible. If I click the eye, it's hidden again. Uh, I can change the resolution here, the properties of the cylinder, for example, having 25 uh, sides, for example. So I press apply again, and now the cylinder is a bit nicer. Uh, I can also change the height here, I can make it two. So every time I change something, the, the button goes green. That means that there are unsaved changes. So if I want to see them, I have to press apply again. And now I see the cylinder is a bit longer. Um, I can also hear, this is a three-dimensional window here. Here I have a lot of controls here for um, changing the view here. I can, for example, here there is a zoom out. I can, and that zooms out so it, everything is in view. Uh, you can also zoom in here using just the, the wheel or the mouse. Uh, you can also, here are prefix axis here so I can look from the X, uh, Y, Z axis, I can do it from the different axis here. So I can quickly view the cam move the camera around different ways. I can also zoom in using the window here. I can go back, zoom the data like this. Uh, in parallel, the data can be visualized in different ways. So if you see here, there is a surface menu here. This shows you the ways data can be displayed. So if you start with the wireframe, that shows you the actual primitives that this object consists of. So this is a, just draws the outline of every object here. You can see there is faces here uh, drawn. And then you can use surface with edges that draws the surface with the wireframe as well. So you can see the faces of the model. You can do uh, surface that was the default here. Uh, you can do points, but it only shows the points of the model. Uh, and then you can also do outline here. So if you have a really large object, you can just display the outline of it, then it's easier to rotate and manipulate. We will not have these complex objects in this course, but not good to know. Go back to surface. Um, I can also change the coloring here. So you can see also the surface things that are also available in the properties section here. So I can change the solid, solid color as the default. I can press edit here. I can do a red cylinder. Now it's red. And then I can also change, uh, for example, uh, opacity, which can be very important if you have a, a scientific data you want to look into. It's very difficult to see. Should be a bit transparent. Uh, then I can also do make it more shiny so that it's uh, like plastic. Like this. Uh, then I can also add uh, axis here so I can see the scale of the model. So you start creating objects, then you work through here, set the properties, press the apply button. <clears throat> but this is, a, is kind of a synthetic example. So uh, usually you get data from fire development simulation or you get from a flow simulation. So I will show an example of this here. I will do um, press the reset button here to remove everything. It's slow because I'm recording as well. So now instead, we are going to uh, open data. There is a folder here that calls examples here that points to the example folder of Paraview. And I will use the disk out ref example two. This is a flow simulation with a heated element in the cylinder. 
So now you see I read the data. You can also see here that it contains some property data. So that these are fields that can be visualized. So we're, what we're going to look is the temperature here and also the velocity. Here. So we import everything, press apply. And now we get a cylinder again, but you can see there's a hole here. And there is a heat source applied here on the, on the bottom of the cylinder here. So the first thing here, okay, this is not very useful. So we want to visualize the temperature field. Uh, so we go down in the properties here. And you can see the coloring is set to uh, solid. And now we change to temperature instead. Now you can see it turns to blue. And you can also see here that, that I have a color scale here now displaying uh, the temperatures here, blue and red. And you can also see here, I have to kind of turn and look into this. You can see that there is a high temperature here on this, this bottom here, but I can't really see inside the object. So how do we solve that? Then we use the, the tools that are available for us to actually cut away this model. So if you look up here, you can see there is a calculator that is a way of calculating new fields from existing data. There is a contour tool that can create contour surfaces or lines if you have to be. And there is a clip tool. And we are going to cut through this, to this uh, object here, volume. And now you can see here the pipeline browser. So this is the data set I read in. So this is the file. And then the pipeline continues here with the clipping tool. So all the data from this one goes into this clip here. And now you can see here, I got, I got a kind of tool to display the cutting plane. So the red uh, rectangle here is the cutting plane. You can move this cutting plane here by using this arrow here. Uh, should be able to move it back and forth like this. Uh, I will try to reset this one. You can also here, here you can see the origin of the cutting plate and the normal of the cutting plate. Uh, and I can set this to different things. I can do X, Y normal, Z normal, X normal. I can also do it to the camera normal. So this is the vector going from the camera. It's kind of, it's the same um, normal as I'm looking at. I think we go with the X normal like this. And then we are, when we are satisfied with the cutting plane, we press apply. Now you can see here that uh, the main object here, the eye turned off. So the original data is not shown, but this, the result of the clipping tool is shown. Now if we turn around the model here, you can see here that now we can see inside the model. So this is a temperature simulation. Um, of course, we don't want to see this cutting plane anymore. So we can uncheck this button here and then the cutting plane goes away. So perhaps we should uh, display the, some uh, streamlines here to see how uh, it flows inside this model. And now we click again on the main data here. Uh, so we will create another but it's independent of the clipping tool. So I will do this one called Stream Tracer. Now you can see here that I have two things coming out of this one. So we have a Stream Tracer here that takes the same data as this one, it goes into this one now. Now we haven't pressed apply here, so the eye is still closed. And the Stream Tracer will work with the entire model. So not only the slice, um, and we will uh, use the vectors here. So there is a vector data set as well that uh, uh, describes the, the flow inside the model. And then uh, let's see here, we will seed, point cloud. So what, what will happen now is that the program will generate particles that will spread along the vector field in the model. And they will be released in this sphere here, which is this small. So I will 
and the radius here from 3.5. So it covers the entire world. And then you can uh, set how many points it should release. So this case, we start with 100. Right? Press apply. Now you can see here that we have streamlines here. Coming up. I have to do it a bit more. I will. So the release from the hot surface, you can see that there are turbulence coming out from this. And I can display the clip here again. And what we can do now is we can make the clip surface a bit transparent. So that we can look through it. So we do go down to opacity and we make it a bit transparent. You can also make the streamlines uh, be colored, uh, solid color instead. Now they are colored uh, on the speed, the, the velocity. So let's see here. We can scale, we can scale them also by, by the speed. So we do solid color. Uh, what we can do as well here to make, make the three mass a bit more visible, we can uh, generate three dimensional objects from, from the lines here. So we can do filters here. And here you can see that, uh, how powerful this program is. So these are the filters you can apply to your data. So you have a uh, Expel cells, you can annotate, you can extract surface, uh, a lot of things that take data and do something about uh, on it, and uh, you can work, continue working on it. And what we are going to do is we can look something for um, tube. There is something called tube. And tube takes lines and generates tubes that are a bit more easy to see than we visualize. So we're going to select tube. And then the properties here is that uh, number of size, that is uh, how many size that each tube should have, radius here. In many of these parameters, there is a uh, rotating icon like this. That will calculate some kind of uh, automatic size, optimal size. So we do this, we already did that. And let's press apply and see what happens. Now you can see it created tubes from these lines. I think they're a bit thick, so we change the scale a bit here. Like this. Now we can also uh, color them by speed, for example. Like this. So in this way, you can take your data and you can pass it through filters and generate a really nice visualization of the data. Uh, and you can all see here that I, I can selectively turn off and on different things. Here. I can, it's also possible to change the, col uh, the, the, the colors. So if you want to change here this color scale, we uh, select uh, the main one. Uh, so coloring temperature, you can press edit here. Then you get a color scale here and you can click the folder with the heart. That will display several of these standard color scales. So let's see if we can do uh, something that goes from uh, something be hot and Dark, apply. Now I can see here that we have what is more white here. And then we can go back here again and we can do turn on the tubes. And perhaps we should make them a bit more transparent. And we can also change the color scale of the tubes. 
So Hey, some cameras, but not this person, the best one. And we have to apply our artistic skills here to do the best way. This is the main photo of Parable, but take your data. You have to provide the data in a form that you can read from, from Parable, and then you can do a lot of filters and uh, visualize in different ways. So, so how do we get data into Paris? One question. Yes. Is it possible to export in EPS format? In EPS? Uh, vectorized format? I think so. You can save a screenshot, uh, but not in, not in a vector format. So it, it, it will generate images. It's not vector based. It's vector based in terms of, but the generated images are always uh, vector uh, images. So I will open. So in Python, there is a special toolkit called PyDTK. And if you install CloudFirm on your machines, you should have that library available already. So the library is not the visual library. The only purpose of this library is to create the data structure that you need to import or export the data into, um, in a format called DTK, which you can read in that part. As I said before, DTK supports uh, image data, rectilinear grids, uh, structured grids, unstructured points, polygonal data, and unstructured grids. So the first steps here you don't have to do, those are probably installed already in your Microsoft installation, so I will do it here for this lecture. So in the first Example here. Uh, we will define the data, and it's a bit similar to defining uh, element topology. So you define points here, it's the list, and you define the polygons, and those are defined with topology. So this is from point zero, one, two, and three, points four, five, six, and seven, and so on. And you create add those to a data structure or object poly data object uh, that, that contains points and polygons. That is our structure that we visualize. And then, in addition to the structure, you also need data to visualize. So, in this case, you need to provide uh, point data. So, in parallel, you can visualize data on the nodes of the elements. Uh, so in the corners of the elements, and also in the middle of the elements called cells. Uh, and if you want to visualize data on the points, you create a point data structure. Then you create an object called scalars here, where you provide all the values for each point. So in this case, we have eight points here, and we have eight scalar values connected to it. So the first point with a scalar value is zero, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then you can also provide a name here. Uh, and that name will be visible in parameter. So if you want to search for your data, what data to visualize, this name will be shown. So it's important that you give your data some logical names. So now we have point data, and then we want to attach data to the cells. So then we have something called cell data. And the same way here, in this case, we have uh, five polygons here, one, two, three, four, five, and we put scalars, one, two, three, four, and up to five in these cells. And provide up cell scalars. Normals here is a bit not necessary, but it provides you with normals on the surfaces. You don't really have to do that. And then you can also have field data, which is another 
we can skip this here. But the important thing is we can provide scalars to the cell data as well. That means that every element will have a single color. Or, or also, you can also attach vectors to when they come to that vector. And then to generate the data, we create something called VTK data, where we combine all these things together. So we need a structure for the geometry. We need point data for the data at the points. Now we need cell data for the data in the cells. We can export them two ways. Uh, we do a VTK2 file, name of the file, and the format here. So ASCII is a text file, which you can actually open in the editor. There's also a version here called with binary here, which is a binary file format. It could be useful if you have larger models. Uh, let me just run this. Um, you should have a file here, example one, VTK. So they won't get the VTK extension, which you can open directly in Python. Uh, and then if you look at how this will look, So this is how a VTK file looks. It's a text file. I provide some extra <laughs> description here. Uh, this is data set 2.0, ASCII. First you said, now it's, we define a polydata data structure. We have eight points of integers. This polygons, six um, by 30. And we list them here. Cell data, six. And we don't have to do this. So if we were created this manually, we had to create this file ourselves and write it as a file. Using the VTK classes, we can create this automatically. So let's look at this data here. So we have example one. Uh, example. One. And this will be a cube. And you can see here we have point data here. Let's see what we, the scalars here we defined um, zero on that point and seven here. So it interpolated over these. Um, you can also cell scalars here that would be so every surface here will be color given by the cell value you gave it so from zero to five and so normal so let's skip that one so this is from zero to seven i'm not sure why it's okay but but you get it's kind of so the name here is what you define in the color so let's reset. So in the next example, we have structured points. So this is a structured grid of three by four by six elements. So it's a kind of a, a three-dimensional grid. And then we provide point data here by just listing the points for every point in this grid here. We give data to it. Uh, right. So this will, be, this will map to um, the rows and columns in, in, the, in the grid directly. So let's run that. So the data here is from zero to 50. So we can check this later when we open this in parallel. So now it, it defines an outline here. And we can go uh, surface with edges here. So here you can see the grid. So you have one, two, three 
one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, five, six. So the, the values goes into the nodes here, in this, this here. So every node here would have a, a point value provided. So if we go scalar zero, you can see we have values from zero to 50. Um, we can also say so it goes through here. And we can actually, you can see, we can do a cut here. So we can see the values here. So in the middle here, there should be like 40. And here you have 50. So this is one way of easy important three dimensional data is doing a grid with rows, columns, and depth columns. Uh, and layers. And you can also, if you already have a, a model on, on disk, uh, you can open an existing model here using giving a file here and say, I will only read the structure. So I, I will not take the, the scalar values, I will just take the, the grid structure. Then I can use a function here to compute on the structure. So we take structure scalars, take the function here, function values, uh, this is just a name here, and then we save it here. So that should be example to Same structure. And now it should compute every node using this function. So you see here that the x, y, z here, which is the name we gave it. Now you can see here it uh, computed values in each column here, depending on the x, y, z value of that point. This is an example where you want to provide <coughs> uh, custom coordinates for your point. So here we have uh, times two here. So we don't want to have by default it uses it goes from zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. You see the this grid here. We want to provide our own coordinates. Please, you can provide them using a separate array here. So we print this. You can see here that we give coordinates for each of the points in this in the grid, and those will be used uh, for scaling the model. So let's see what we get with this one. Like you're saying, but now, now the, the scale is a bit different, so we do access here. There's one. Zero to five here. Yeah, okay. That's good. That's good. Okay, it seems to be, it should be maximum, it should be 10. Okay, I'll get back to that. But basically, the PP here should be the coordinate for each of the grid points. I don't know why it didn't do that. Oh, wait a minute.
I'm not for some reason. So you zero to ten here. And we do a surface images. So now it's here, it goes from zero to 10. So the PP rate we created was actually uh, controls the coordinates. So you can have any coordinates for any, any of these grids and grid points. Uh, you can also create, uh, do the same effect here by using rapid linear grid uh, by defining range ranges of values here. So this basically generates the same thing. Um, skip the six one here, it's interesting. Uh, <coughs> so it's also possible to have a data structure that is a mix of everything, basically unstructured grid. Uh, what that means is that the cells are not connected to each other in any way that you can have both triangles, tetrahedrons, mixed in a single data type. So here we have points. And in this case, we also have vectors connected to the, to, uh, the points. So we want to have that. Uh, we create a VTK unstructured data grid structure with the points. And then we specify what kind of elements we want to create here. So these are all the support elements. You can create hexahedron elements, tetrahedral elements, Polygons, triangle strips. That is a strip that is points connected uh, and connect them, to creating triangles. Quads that are the quad elements, triangles, lines, and vertices. So unstructured grid can take any kind of elements. And uh, so this is what you, if you want to do a CAD model, you can take that and uh, create an unstructured grid model uh, with the elements in the CAD model. And then we also attach point data here. So at every point in this model, we create and add vectors. And we add scalars here as well, 27 of them. So we have two fields, one vector field and one scalar. And we save this to example three. Reset. Open. So here you can see here that this is a really strange model. Uh, we do a surface with edges here. See, we do the wireframe here, you can see it right now. So here are lines, you have triangles, you have quartz, you have tetrahedral elements here. And you can also see that we put um, uh, value, scalar values on each of the nodes. But we also have vectors. And we can display vectors in, in uh, Paraview as well. Uh, so what we will do is, let me set this. So you can see here, we have coloring from the scale, but we also have a vector field. To display a vector field, we need to use something called a glyph. And a glyph is a symbol that you put 
at each node where you have a vector and you orient this cliff in the vector direction. So let's do that. And then you can set here what kind of glyph you want to your vector to represent. So arrow is the default. And you, you also, of course, have to, which field should control the vectors and what should scale the vector as well. So we scale it by the vectors themselves, scale by magnitude, scale factor, and we press apply. Now you can see here that we have vectors at each point as well. So each of these here is a shift is oriented in a vector direction at each of these points. So for example, if you have a principal stresses that we want to, you can have a glyph that you can orient that in the direction of the principal stress. Of course, you have to have two, but you can have two vector fields as well. I will show you that after the coffee break here as well. But I will show you here that you can also use cones. You can use uh, boxes, cylinders, so you can basically place everything and visualize your vectors with that. And you can, if, if you have really a lot of vectors, you can, instead of using a three-dimensional model, you can use two big bits or a line. So you know, see you have lines instead of your, if you have a lot of them, it could be, can be hard to draw these three-dimensional vectors as well. I don't know, here is a bit difficult to see the vector direction, but you can do that. Um, And then you can, of course, you can scale arrows the scaling factor as well. Uh, and if you have larger models here, you can also, I will show you that later here, uh, you can, it places these arrows uh, distributed uniformly over the model. So it doesn't take every node, but it takes them uniformly. We can also set here, for example, every all points. As it actually removes some of the vectors here. Uh, I can also show every end point, so that will be every third point. Or you can see it removes some of them, every second point, like this. Because sometimes if you have uh, large models, you can have millions of these arrows, and it's difficult to see. Then you can set uh, the distribution that is even distributed over the model. Uh, and that way you can curve the number of vectors. And of course, you can all, everything you can do, you can put color scales on them. So, for example, I can, for the, the vectors here, I can scale them in different now they are actually colored by the scalar values, which is a bit, you have to be a bit careful. Um, you're colored by the, by the vectors here, and I can set a separate vector color scale as well for the vectors. I think we take. Uh, uh, 10 minute or 15 minute break, come back at 20 post. Then I would do, so do a finite element example with Confed. So, with that hard work, <laughs> we start. Uh, so, I'm going to show you how we can do this in Confed as well. So, I'm going to do this with a, this is the example six in the, if we go to the examples on GitHub, we can find this example. It's a two-dimensional stress problem uh, with a structured mesh uh, with indentation here. We have pull from both sides. So in this case here, uh, we just set up some parameters here. Uh, and then we, this is a, there's a lot of geometry here that is a bit uh, complicated. But, it's a parametric problem here, and we create our surface G mesh here. Uh, and we create a mesh, assemble a problem, solve it, just like normal here. And then we generate also uh, from Mises scalars and principal, have three lists here, one Mises list, one principal one, and principal two. We calculate our element forces and append these to these lists here. And th that is also one of the limitations of uh, the pi BTK module is that it requires lists. So it can't take input as uh, non pi rays. But I will show that it's quite easy to overcome this problem. Uh, 
So exporting to VTK. So the first thing we do is we convert our coordinates here from mesh. Uh, and we use a method called two list here, which will return a link uh, uh, multiple level list instead of a number array. Uh, we create our polygons here. Uh, we go on a mesh top of minus one because BTK is zero based indexing. As our element topology is one based because it's degrees of freedom, we just subtract one from all the elements here and convert that to the list. Uh, we also need to create a vector field of our displacements. So you can see here we have displacements here. And we uh, just loop through our uh, A vector here and create vectors for each point. So we create point data here with our displacements. And then we, we need to create uh, scalars. From the formation stresses are scalars in the cells. Uh, we create vectors here for our principal one. We call that principal one. We create vectors two, and then we call principal two. And then we create our cell data, and we attach our scalars, which is our Mises uh, stresses. Uh, we also create our vectors here, uh, attach them to the cell because there are the principal stresses are in the middle of the element, and we attach them. So cell data is scalars, vectors, and um, vectors. Then we create our structure from our points and our polygons. And then we create our BTK data here by combining cell data and point data. So point data, we created the, uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, Okay, uh, we create point data here, vectors, uh, displacements. So that should be. So let's run this and see. And we export this to EXM6 BTK. Nordis. Okay. So now we should be able to go into. So if we start by just making a line here. So now you can see this is the geometry we created. And already now it actually displays the phonesis stresses directly on the elements. Uh, you can see here you have scalar value that is the Mises stresses. And we have displacement, principle one, principle two. You can also see by the icons here that we have that these are cell values and this is scalar values. And the displacements are in, in nodes, that is a point here. Um, so, for me, this is pretty easy. Perhaps we should change the color scale. Uh, we keep it like that. Uh, so we want to visualize the displacements as well. Uh, and to do that, we, we can uh, use our vectors to uh, deform our mesh. 
So as the displacements are vectors, the displacement of each node, we can use them to deform our mesh. So we use the warp tool here, warp by vector. And then we say the vectors are, you can, there is only one vector field, so there's nothing to choose. We calculate our displacement magnification factor automatically, and we press apply. Okay, now you see that it's the deformed mesh, but we would like to see the original mesh as well. So what we can do then is we can change the representation of our mesh to be wireframe, like this. And you can also see, we want to see, have the, the background mesh available as well. So we press the eye here, and you can see that the background mesh. And also we probably shouldn't display any colors on the deformed mesh, we change the colors of the warp mesh. We put solid color. Now you can see here that we have, let's see if we, we can also, if we want to have, can make it a bit translucent as well here. I think the scale factor is a bit too much. But now we have, now we come to how we visualize the principal stresses. So now we want to go back to our original mesh and not be the display them on the. So if we have, if we keep this the warp mesh, uh, the warp vector selected, if we, if we proceed to do vector visualization here, it will be applied on the deformed elements, which we don't want. So we want to visualize the principal stresses on the original element geometry. That's why we select this one here as a starting point. Uh, then we use the glyph tool. And now I can see here, uh, we will select lines here and orientation array should be principle one, scale array should be principle one, uh, calculate automatically like this, and we apply. And then we hide our warp mesh here for a moment. We change the coloring here to solid color. So we can see here that we have this bit thin. Um, not sure if we can change the thickness. Uh, so now we have problem. Now we need to visualize the the second principle as well in the same area. Now we have to be careful here. So let's do it. We select the mo the model here again. We do if again. In this case, we select principle two. Scale error principle two, and then we set the color to. Now we've got 3D arrows and everything. And that was what my, we do lines again. And now you see the scaling is a bit off for the, <laughs> the second principal stress. So we need to, what we do, need to do, we should use the same scaling as for um, the main, the first principal stress. So if we go back here again, and we copy the scale factor here over to the second one. So now we get them in a bit better. So they have the same scale. And we also need to change the color to solid like this. So now we have visualized both of them. And we can, of course, here we can change our all points. Same thing with this one here. Uh, has every principal stress display. So this is how you can visualize stresses here. And you, of course you can use vector fields for flow in groundwater or in, in temperature problems as well. You can do the same kind of uh, equations. 
So another thing that uh, you can do with Paraview is you can do really easy animations. So we'll do reset here again. So every, uh, if you name your files, the DPK files with, with this number, so numbering from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, Paraview we can open these files, all of them automatically as one single model. So if you want to visualize, for example, the parameter <coughs> study, you can do that by saving every time of calculation in, in your parameter barrier as, as a single file, and then open them as a single file. And you can always see, if you look at the file browser here, see some, something, some of the files have this uh, arrow here. Example one, two, three. So if, if I click this one, it will open all, all of these as one, two, three, and four. One, two, three. The problem is that these, these are unrelated, so it's not useful. But I have here a parameter stress uh, thing here that goes from one, two, three, four, five, and six. And if I, if I click on the top one here, it will open all of them at the same time. You probably recognize this problem, you have done this first problem. Um, so here you have a notch here. And now you can see also that I have on the top here, there is a time zero to max five. So if I just click here next frame, you can see here that it switches from these, this different, um, so I have five here. And the nice thing with this is that it will use the same color scale for all of the time steps or all of the parameter studies, so you can compare them. So you can see here, you can see the max stress is this one. And if I go back again, you can see that the, the max stress is, there's not so much errors with max stress. Here. You can even animate it with the loop as well. And you can do the same thing for, if you want to do uh, principal stresses as well. So that is also, uh, I will show that for um, first. Should be uh, this one as well. So if you are familiar with the groundwater problem, you can see here I can change the depth here on the slot. So it makes it very easy to do complicated time variant problems, or if you if you want to compare different parameters, you can do it like this. And then you can animate it if you want to. Um, that was actually what I wanted to talk about today. I hope you will join on the next lecture next week. Uh, usually very interesting things we will talk about. So uh, by that, I thank you for today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>